Hello, everyone, and welcome back to an all-new episode of The Financial Confessions. It's me, your host, Chelsea Fagan, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet and woman who loves to talk about money. And when it comes to talking about money and how we handle it, how we deal with it, how we work, how we manage our lives, we often run into the topic of mental health and neurodivergence as it pertains to all of the above. It's important to realize that all of the habits that we talk about, the best practices, the things that we recommend for basically everyone to embrace when it comes to their work and their finances is not going to be equally accessible or equally easy for everyone. And one of the most common obstacles that people face when it comes to managing not just these habits and routines, but also their emotions around them is ADHD. This is a subject that is probably, I would say one of the top three, if not the most requested subjects that we've gotten to cover on TFC, and it's something that I wanted to find someone to talk about with who not only can talk about it from the more clinical and medical perspective, but also talk about it from personal experience. My guest today is someone who actually happens to live smack in the middle of that very particular Venn diagram. She is a psychiatrist, and she's also a clinical specialist in ADHD, and she also was herself diagnosed with ADHD in fourth grade and has a book that just came out in January called Self Care for People with ADHD. So I honestly can't think of anyone who would be better placed to talk about that subject and how it interacts with our money and our lives and all the things we talk about at TFC than my guest today, Dr. Sasha Hamdani. Hello. Hi, Chelsea. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. And thanks to Issue for supporting TFC. Issue is the all-in-one platform to create and distribute beautiful digital content, from marketing materials and magazines, to catalogs and portfolios, and more. Get started with Issue today for free, or sign up for an annual premium account and get 50% off when you go to issue.com slash podcast and use promo code TFC. Um, So I obviously gave a little bit of context to who you are, but I'd love to hear in your own words kind of the work you do and what drew you to cover this topic and write this book. Yeah, so I um, I knew from a young age that I wanted to do medicine. My mom is a pediatrician and, like, objectively the happiest person in America. She just loves her job. And so I knew I wanted to do that. And so when I went through medical school, I started to kind of struggle with my own attention and focus and regulation issues, and it, it became a huge challenge for me. And so that kind of led me into thinking about psychiatry. And honestly, I ended up doing a rotation in pediatric psychiatry, and I loved it. And so that kind of led me down this pathway. And then as I got into psychiatry more and started to figure out how my own brain was working, it led me to want to understand ADHD a little bit better. And that's, I mean, that's kind of what led me to the book. Amazing. Um, And I will note that we got an overwhelming number of questions for, um, should I I call you Sasha or Dr. Hamdani? What do you prefer? Call me whatever you want. Sasha's great. Well, now I want to call you Dr. Hamdani. (laughs) And I should note that we did uh, get an overwhelming number of questions for Dr. Hamdani, so we will be going over those. But I did want to start with a few of my own, and probably the biggest one that I think a lot of people watching someone like yourself would have is... You know, you're someone who was diagnosed with ADHD in fourth grade, so this is something that you've been living with and managing your entire adult life, and and then some. At least outwardly, you seem like an incredibly put together, accomplished, you know, kind of with it woman. Um, what's the secret? How are you making it work? <laughs> oh my God, um, very generous. Um, well, I I think I think there's a couple of things happening. I was diagnosed in fourth grade, but my parents at that time, and again, I'm not going to disclose my age, but it's old. And so it it was it was in a time where ADHD wasn't really talked about and it was still extremely stigmatized. Um, and so my parents at that time, I was a sensitive kid, didn't know how to bring it up. And so they, we, I, they proceeded forward with the testing process and diagnosis, but I didn't actually know it was ADHD. I didn't know that was what was happening. So I was taking a medication and I knew it was going to help me with school, but I didn't know to what context. Did okay. Got out of high school, went directly to medical school because I ended up doing well enough that I placed into a program. But then that was the first time I was away from home. And so wheels fell off. I, I couldn't like regulate anything. I wasn't taking medication. 
And that's really when I feel like I got properly diagnosed because at that time, that's when it was like, okay, you have ADHD. I was like, absolutely not. I do not have that. And then it became me kind of struggling with figuring out the diagnosis. So I feel like my journey really started at like 18 or 19 when I actually like conceptualized that and then just kind of dealing with that a little bit at a time. And I was really fortunate because when I got out of medical school and entered psychiatry, I was still (laughs) all over the map. Mm. And I was surrounded by psychiatrists and therapists at that time through my training program. And they quite literally broke down this is how you eat. This is how you sleep. This is how, and they broke down everything in very digestible chunks. And I think that helped me build a foundation strong enough that I could start to make my own modifications to get to where I am, which is still very much a work in progress. Well, I mean, to that point, when you're talking about, you know, getting that very literal kind of roadmap for this is how you do all of the basic functions that you need to do, um, Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like in practice in terms of the tools that you use, the practices you put in place, things that really help you um, achieve at the level that you you want to be? I think it boils down to initially, before even figuring out the steps to correct behavior, it's figuring out what your previous behavior was. So recognizing your, your own patterns. And for me, what was difficult is every day felt like I was reinventing the wheel. And that's part of like what I think a lot of ADHD people struggle with, with finances and things like that, is just every day you're trying to do something different to stay on top of this and you never really get secure footing to build off of. And so I think that was one of the most important things is learning how to actually objectively look at what I was doing, build and have enough data points in order to modify behavior. And so that was that was kind of the steps recognizing my patterns was the important thing in terms of then figuring out, okay, I don't sleep appropriately. This is what I need to do. I don't eat appropriately. I like I could either go hours without eating because I wasn't hungry at all because I'd be distracted by something else. Or I would eat all day because it was just like mindless eating and I wasn't focusing on what I was doing. And it, it just, you know, there were so many different things where I felt I was just completely unaware of what I was doing on a day to day basis. So essentially we got an endless number of some version of my ADHD makes handling money incredibly difficult in particular. Um, What are some specific strategies about managing money when you have ADHD? So I'll give you a couple of them. Number one, it is, so, uh, you know, a lot of times people talk about like, doing a budget and figuring out what's important to you, what's not, or, or figuring out like, this is the money I want to spend. This is what I'm going to spend on food. This is what I'm going to spend on rent, which I'm going to spend on like utilities, you know, and just breaking it down very, um, categorically. I feel like that is such an intense task for someone who's dealing with executive function and it's like impossible to prioritize or to plan ahead and think about like, okay, this is where my money is going to go and be able to maintain that. So I think reframing your idea of a budget and using it more as like income and outcome and then prioritizing what's important to you. Like what, what do I like, what do I need to focus on as like, this has to happen this month. So I need to set aside this money and the rest of this money that I I have or may not have, but what is important to me that I'm allowed to spend stuff on? So I I mean, am I a lot like, is this like doing it in a non-judgment way? Like if you're like, I, I mean, don't go into debt over it, but if you're like, I like this gives me great personal value being able to go to Sephora and be able to pick what I want from Sephora and I give myself a little treat. Like that's something that's meaningful to you. Like spend that money, do that. And and taking away the shame and guilt behind that because that's what's important to you. And it, does, it doesn't matter that you, anybody else might be like, that's a frivolous purchase, you should go return it. If that's important to you, set aside that money to do that. The second thing that's important that is a, a unique concept to ADHD is handling the impulsivity part of it. Mm. And I think financial impulsivity, and I I could tell you this from like a personal experience, it is really, really 
common, but it's also really, really um, hazardous, right? Because a lot of times with that impulsivity, what you're actually, you're spending money, but what you're actually trying to do is kind of stimulate your brain. So you're in this like low dopamine state and you're just like, I'm a little bit bored. And you're like, this will make me more interested. This looks fun. This is interesting. And it releases some dopamine off into your brain. And, and you probably get home and you're like, this was stupid. Why did I do this? Now I feel guilt and shame about things like that. So I think, and I, I do this to this day, I recognize, I was telling you about my TJ Maxx Soho experience mm-hmm. that I want to go and do later this afternoon. <laughs> I recognize even in TJ Maxx, I'm going to have impulsivity problems. That's just who I am and that's what's going to happen. And I took out cash. This is my hard limit. I mm. can't spend on a card. This is my cash limit. This is how much. Hopefully I won't spend that much. But if I do, I won't feel bad about it. So I think it's just like recognizing your patterns and things like that. I also want to take a second to acknowledge the absolutely vicious cycle of money and mental health because speaking personally, nothing did even remotely as much to help my anxiety, which used to be debilitating and is now like not even really that much of a consideration than moving up several tax brackets, um, no longer having, first of all, being able to access healthcare in a really uncomplicated way, but also no longer having the day-to-day stress and shame and anxiety mm. of not having enough. Um, that was completely transformational. And I've heard a lot of other people kind of anecdotally say that getting financially stable really, really helped a lot of their mental health issues on so many different fronts, but it can be a completely vicious cycle of being unable to get there while you're not only struggling with, you know, any mental health issue, but also the uh, just constant hamster wheel of not having enough. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It's it's such a, it's an important consideration for mental health for sure, because I think it bleeds into every aspect of accessibility possible, right? Totally. Like you can't, you can't access behavioral modification most of the time you can't access medication you can't access eating better sleeping better because you're just chronically stressed out and releasing neurochemicals telling you're stressed out and it just continues to worsen so I think I think it's um such a good thing to talk about totally in your clinical practice, um, when people come in and they're struggling with ADHD, are there really broad patterns that you see in terms of the things that they're struggling with and also sort of maybe easier wins that they could be uh, you know, putting in place in their own lives that they're often not when they first come to you? How much time have you got? I would all the time you need, babe. We are we are seated and ready to listen to these anecdotes. Well, I I think that there's like in, if you're talking about easy wins, right? So, and I'll I'll kind of back up a little bit when even prior to writing this book, I was looking for what are behavioral modifications that <laughs> that I could I like to regulate my own life, but to also help. Um, by that time I had gotten onto social media. So to help my social media following and help my patients, what are things that outside of medication behaviorally I could put into place in an organized fashion so that people could get those easy wins, right? And so that's what got me on this path of, of creating an app for ADHD behavioral modification to help educate you about your brain and then lead to just slow progressive changes to optimize your life and that's called still on the tail end of development but it should be out in the next couple months um and it's called focus genie but some of the things that it does is it helps you recognize your habits so in terms of like it tracks how are you how did you feel like your focus was doing how did you feel like your impulsivity was doing how much did you drink today how much did you eat today what was your sleep like so it tracks that so you get this personalized kind of thing and then with that you have these easier productivity hacks which I feel like are really effective for those those attainable wins so instead of for me I was having a hard time getting tasks started getting tasks done getting overwhelmed with just the sheer volume of tasks coming my way and so it would the the thing that's nice about this is that it has ways of breaking down tasks, of putting in tasks in an, in a 
just an easy, attainable way. You can voice record it. You can jot it down. You can put all these things. And then it's incentivized. So you want to keep achieving more. So I think it's about like in terms of once you figure out here's where the deficit is, what is the pathway that's going to get you to correcting that problem? And oftentimes it's it's what's the most interesting route to get there or what's the easiest route to get there. So things that are stimulating dopamine for your brain because you're going to be more likely to continue those pathways. Now, in terms of, you know, being in these, let's just say like not optimal patterns um, where, you know, as you mentioned, like oftentimes it can feel impossible to start. It can feel impossible to take a first step toward yeah. whatever it is, no matter how kind of small the thing might be. Um, for a lot of people we hear, and this is definitely, I think, very acutely the case with money, um, there becomes a really intense negative feedback loop of shame uh, and feelings of inadequacy and what's wrong with me and all of that. And it can be very hard, I think, for a lot of people to separate out the emotion and the character judgment and things like that. Um, In terms of both, you know, what you've put into practice yourself, obviously your book is a lot about self-care and having that, you know, really positive relationship with, with self. But when it pertains, as it pertains to the emotional aspect in particular, what are some recommendations that you have for people to at least at minimum, like not even dealing with the habits, like let's remove that part of it. So that's, that's actually a really great question because I think with, um, shame in general, it's so pervasive, right? Once that, once that process starts, it's really difficult to get on top of it and pull yourself out of that hole. So I think with one of the things that, you know, clinically it's helpful, but also personally very poignant for me was understanding how my brain worked and understanding that my brain is uniquely wired. Like I'm just never going to be in the same mental computing sphere as a neurotypical person. I just don't think in the same way. I can achieve similar results, but it's in a different way. And so once I understood like, okay, my brain works in a different way, it's it's just a different, it's, it's hard to, it's not hard to, but it, it helps remove some of that shame because you're like, I am not the only person going through this. I am built and wired differently. I can do what I need to do. I just have to handle it a different way. I have to be smarter than this extrinsic system and figure out my own way. So then it becomes a question of problem solving. So I think just giving yourself grace on that front is really important. Mm. In terms of, you know, people who, for whatever reason, let's just say that diagnosis is not available to them right now. um, So they have no real way of knowing whether or not they have ADHD or ADD. Are there, you know, common patterns that you encourage people to look at in their lives to, you know, not even necessarily self-diagnose, but to sort of, because obviously if you're saying that part of the, um, the lifting of the emotional burden comes from accepting that this is, you know, a neurodivergence that is just as, you know, banal as having, you know, a physical, uh, sure. difference. Um, if someone doesn't necessarily have access to the diagnosis that might give that neutrality to it, um, at least to kind of give them a sense of like, this is not normal. Yeah. So I think that, um, first of all, uh, let's back up and talk about the term neurodivergence. So neurodivergent and neurodivergence isn't actually a clinical term. It's something that came about in like the 90s. And it was talking about this wide spectrum of brains that just behave differently for whatever reason. It could be ADHD. It could be autism. It could be a a wide spectrum of mental health um, phenomena. Um, and so I, I like, I like that umbrella. I like not limiting it to like, it's a formal diagnosis. A lot of times what I tell people is you are the expert on your own brain. And if you feel like something is not working appropriately, where I draw the line in terms of like trying to treat yourself, because I think that can get dicey, but in terms of like understanding your own environment and recognizing, Hey, I think something is off. I don't think you necessarily need that formal diagnosis in order to be
be able to give yourself some leeway. Okay. If you feel like your brain is working differently, it probably is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I mean, in terms of the benefit, obviously there can be a lot of structural benefits to a formal diagnosis. Absolutely. Yeah. But there are plenty of people who have a formal diagnosis and are making progress or who yeah. are not, you know, their situation is not improving. So it's certainly not a guarantee that things will get better. And, you know, Chelsea, to be honest with you, access to care is just such a nightmare. Mm. It's like such a mess. It's such a mess. And it's so like our system is so flawed in so many different ways in terms of serving um, just mental health in general. Um, that I think that it's important for people to be able to find ways to pacify this this guilt and shame without necessarily needing to lead on a formal diagnosis. Mm, no, I mean, very well said. Um, so as I alluded to, we have an overwhelming number of questions from our yeah. audience. I'm going to start with some questions from our society member. Do not forget, if you're not a society member, hit the join button or join it patreon in our link and you will always be prioritized as these ladies and gentlemen are okay uh how do you handle a career change when masking no longer works and you can explain masking and burnout has set in or another way to ask how do you build a career that's compatible with your adhd when you can no longer fake it mainly for other health reasons specifically an autoimmune disease that impacts my thyroid Mm. That's such a good question. And thyroid stuff is miserable. I have thyroid stuff going on too. And it's just oh no. like, it's it's a mess because it makes you so cloudy and foggy and, and it just like impact, it like it lowers your baseline automatically and mm. it, it, so many things can throw it off. But I think the concept of masking is conscious or unconscious, a lot of times it's unconscious, behaviors to help integrate into society a little bit better. And people do that in terms of mimicking other behavior they do it in terms of suppressing their own behaviors that might be not optimal for the certain situation so a lot of times people see like suppressing fidgets by aggressively crossing their legs (laughs) things like that um but when you're looking at in a work environment where maybe that masking that has previously gotten you thus far in whatever setting you're at If you can't do that anymore, if you're so fatigued from this autoimmune or thyroid dysfunction that you literally do not have the spoons to continue doing that, then it really becomes an issue of, I mean, clearly this person is talking about a career change. Do I find something that's more compatible with this spot of life that I'm in? And, And that's what becomes really tricky. It's navigating those waters and figuring out because at the end of the day, we need to find a way to, you know, finesse our lives financially that we're comfortable um, or possibly more than comfortable, right? But uh, but how to do that is is you need to accommodate your specific brain functionality. So for example, with ADHD, a lot of times, maybe like getting into a career pathway that is more... Um, native to you so for example something maybe a little bit more creative or something with a little bit more flexibility maybe that's not attainable or maybe that there's no big financial payout with that which is what we hear a lot um sometimes then it's a matter of like well how can i optimize this situation that i'm at to accommodate this so asking for specific work accommodations like can i can I take breaks throughout the day so I can like relieve some restlessness or so I can kind of gather my thoughts and so I don't feel as chained down to the system? Can I listen with headphones or if I'm getting really like overstimulated and I can't really mask or, you know, be sociable in those settings? Can I sit, can I start a little bit earlier so I'm away from the hustle bustle? Can I end a little bit later? Can my deadlines be a little bit more flexible? So there's a lot of different modifications within your environment you could do um there and then also there's career choices which is just like is this like even if I make those accommodations is this going to be compatible for me I also I mean as uh, a business owner and an employer of a decent number of people I think not all business owners are this way not all managers are this way but I do think more than a lot of people expect um there's a huge value in being really proactive with your employer and saying, you know, having a conversation along the lines of, 
I love what I do here. I want to be here long, to- long term. You know, this is a really great job for me in a lot of ways. There are a few things that I think are preventing me from necessarily doing my best work um, because I think a lot of people underestimate the value that having an employee stay at a job is mm-hmm. uh the value that it has for an employer, it's very expensive to replace someone. It's very expensive and time consuming and unpredictable to train a new person, to switch, you know, a whole rollout, especially if you are, you know, a key person in a structure. Um, So really kind of being preemptive about, you know, this is, these are the changes like some of the ones that you mentioned um, that would really help me not just do my best work day to day, but also be able to stay here as long as I would like to. I think, you know, there's no, harm and at least attempting to have that conversation with employers and I think a lot more than people would expect are willing to have some kind of conversation and I think it's important to note in in that account and and that's I go through this in like there's a specific chapter in my book about this because it's it's important enough to you know warrant that you deep dive into some of those accommodations you can ask for but also there's a huge subsect of people that one don't have that formal diagnosis or two aren't super comfortable disclosing it at that point right. just because of you know they're afraid of like the cultural thing so it's nice to be able to have the verbiage to be like you don't have to say i have adhd and so i need these accommodations but spinning it in a way like you know what i've noticed that i do better work when i'm away from more chaotic environments is it okay if i tilt my desk away from this situation or if I listen with headphones so I can focus a little bit better so you're not actually saying I have ADHD so we have to do these things but you're kind of soft stepping into that Hmm. so if you're if you don't necessarily want to disclose there are also other ways to make it more accessible to you well said um okay Reading, watching, slash listening recs for parents of children with ADHD and or autism, especially parents who are realizing that they may have been diagnosable themselves, but never were. Yeah. I would also, to add on to that question, I would love to hear you explain a little bit um, kind of some of the connections between ADHD and autism for people who might be wondering why they would be in the same question. So I'll start with that. So I'm not... um by any means an expert on autism specifically and I feel like the distinction there is because it, autism generally generally and there's a there's late diagnosis of autism now and especially becoming more and more prevalent but historically it's something that you would notice at early developmental stages which is kind of what you hear about ADHD as well um, and it has moved from like discrete diagnoses to like a big wide spectrum of neurodevelopmental behaviors and not predictable, but like a range and spectrum of disorder. Um, why ADHD is different or similar? I mean, I, I really could answer this question a bunch of different ways, but I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna choose this way because it's. I'm feeling spicy. Um, I don't love the DSM, to be totally honest with you. DSM is the, you know, the diagnostic criteria that we use to to outline what meets criteria for certain um, diagnoses. I don't love it because I feel like it's way too narrow of a scope for ADHD. So at this point, in terms of like, what's the difference between ADHD and autism? There are many, many different differences. And there's there's some, some key... Um, similarities in terms of like it, it, their different shades of neurodivergence but I feel like we need to learn more and we need to expand our scope of ADHD a little bit and then we might see more similarities or differences with autism I forgot the original question what was it the original question <laughs> uh was recommendations for parents who have a child um who's diagnosed and especially if they may have been diagnosable themselves but but weren't yeah so I will give you a couple of resources that I absolutely love. One of them, which I don't feel like we talk about enough, is understood.org. It is a f- absolutely free resource for parents, um, for kids, for students. And the thing that's amazing about this is that I love how they lay out the information. So they have scripts for parents. So for parents that are wondering like, how do I navigate this? What is an IEP? What is a 504? How do I get through this school system? Um, and even above and beyond school system, there's scripts that it, the parents can like read through. These are the questions I need to be asking. These are the, the, and it's free. 
It's mm. free. We love free. I'm telling you. So it and I've worked with them in the past and they're an incredible nonprofit resource. I love them. Love them. And my I talked about her before, my pediatrician mom. I got her hooked onto that and that's just part of her resources now. So that's one of them. Um, the other place you could go, um, it, the problem is that there is a lot of really good information. It's just, it's hard to figure out what is reliable. So it, usually if I'm like, okay, we'll go to, and let's figure out in terms of like social media, good sites to go to. It, it's, it's hard because you're, you're at the whims of the algorithm. So you could get a lot of good information and get a lot of bad information. Um, but there are, um, if you are following someone on social media, I can't think of anyone off the top of my head for good autism information. Um, but if you're following someone for clinical information, um, I would double check and make sure that they have, um, the criteria to be able to be sharing that information. And what's helpful is that YouTube is now rolling out like health badges and that's a Good. slow ongoing process which was like a, this thing to cultivate and make sure that this is good sound information and I hope I hope a lot of the other um, platforms adopt that. I want to take a quick pause and thank Issue for sponsoring today's episode of the Financial Confessions. Here at TFD we're constantly creating content and thinking of new ways to share our message and values with the TFD community. Whether it be through social media posts, newsletters, workbooks, as well as templates, spreadsheets, and checklists. Whether you work for yourself or you're part of a team like us, Issue can help share your brand's message with the world. Issue is the all-in-one platform to create and distribute beautiful digital content from marketing materials and magazines to catalogs and portfolios and so much more. It also works seamlessly with the tools you already use, like Canva, which we love here at TFD, as well as Dropbox, MailChimp, and InDesign. Put new life into your content by transforming newsletters, workbooks, brochures, and more from flat PDFs to interactive digital publications and social posts for your audience to engage with worldwide. Share content that's beautiful and fun across every channel and on every device. You can start using Issue for free. Try it out and explore premium features that offer a more customized experience. If, like us, you are on the content creation hamster wheel but want to keep things fresh, beautiful, and engaging, give Issue a try and use our promo code. Get started with Issue today for free or sign up for an annual premium account and get 50% off when you go to issue.com slash podcast and use promo code TFC. That's I-S-S-U-U dot com slash podcast and use promo code TFC at checkout for your free starter account or 50% off an annual premium account. That's issue.com slash podcast with promo code TFC. Man, I have to say, I always kind of go back and forth. It's kind of the same thing in the financial space as well, but to I think it's even more dangerous with the medical and mental health space. Is like on the one hand, everyone's talking about it. That's great. But on the other hand, you have, I mean, everyone's talking about it. And yeah. the amount of misinformation, the amount of bad information, you know, you often see like sometimes you'll see like actual therapists or it appears to be clinicians talking about their own patients. I'm like, is this even legal? Like, um, but also a lot of people who really don't have any expertise or credentials and are just kind of, you know, saying any old thing on TikTok. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there is absolutely, I won't discredit the validity in terms of lived experience. I think that that's mm. an important part of the story to tell for sure. But I think once you start moving into like, hey, this is this is a part of the diagnostic criteria or this is how to treat or this is how you can move forward safely. I think it's really important to m make sure you're just more cognizant of who you're following because I think that can get dicey. Oh, totally. But I mean, also there's, I mean, there are huge overlaps with like, for example, you know, there's massive popularity. We have a, another podcast we do where we deep dive into a lot of scams and the prevalence of things like, you know, essential oils and, you know, aromatherapy and all of this stuff that, you know, is snake oil in a big way. But also I think there's a, a we're at a sort of strange moment, I think, culturally, where on the one hand, I think for a lot of us, we're becoming more aware in a more nuanced and thoughtful way about a lot of mental health issues than we were before. But on the other hand, there's, I think, an increasing prevalence of this idea that like this is a modern phenomenon, that it only exists because of whatever modern um, 
culprit they kind of want to identify rather than what I think is the more obvious answer, which is that this has likely always existed. It just was not diagnosed or diagnosable. Um, and it can lead to a lot of really dangerous places. Yeah. I think I, I, I think I think you are right. I think this has been around for forever. We just didn't talk about it. Hmm. We didn't talk about it. We didn't explore this. And we didn't understand the we didn't understand like what are the impacts of mental health and the scope of just health in general. Um, and I think that that is something that is so incredible that's coming out of the past 10 and like five, five years ish. Really, it's really started. I mean, this is the first time when I was working um, with the White House and with the Surgeon, Ge- Surgeon General just came out with an advisory yesterday about the impact of loneliness in terms of like its health um, concerns in terms of like dementia and stroke risk and cardiovascular health. I've never seen anything like that. I've never seen someone like a, someone that high up talking about mental health in that sphere. So I think this is incredible that we're talking about it. But I also think it makes it this huge market for like very predatory behavior, right? Mm. It's just absolutely people cannibalizing like this very vulnerable population in order to make money and profit off of it. So there's there's a lot of garbage. There is a lot of garbage uh, on the internet in really all domains. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, how do I handle friends and family who say, you're just lazy or you just need to focus? And also, how do I handle people who think that all medication is inherently bad? Oh, those are two super long, juicy questions. Well, I will tell you that... And I, I literally, because this is something that I get asked about all the time, I, um, well, now I can't find it. There's a whole chapter about how to talk to people you love about ADHD. How do you, how do you disclose it? How do you talk about it clinically? How do you let them know within your circle and even outside of your circle how, what you're dealing with and how to support you and how you can... <laughs> You can modify your behavior, but I think a lot of that comes down to dialogue, right? Being able to communicate because doing that, just like you were talking about with your employer, being preemptive about that, being able to speak in an open fashion in a way that, you know, both parties are truly listening. That's actually a a really, um, it's a really nice and privileged situation to have. A lot of people don't have that. You know, their their support systems aren't willing to hear that. You should study more. You should pray more. Just put it on a to-do list like that. Okay, <laughs> cool. It's not going to help me. Right. So I think that there is, you know, just for me, what I have found to be really helpful is to broach things in a very clinical way fashion. And and I don't mean clinical in the way of like, you have to go to school and become an MD and then talk about it. I mean, talking about it in a way that separates the emotional component of it. Like, instead of being very reactive and being like, I'm not lazy, you keep calling me lazy, this is just really hurtful. You might start with, you know, my brain works really quickly. It's a dopamine based circuitry. I, I have a dopamine dysregulation problem. And again, this might be a little bit too clinical, but even like if you, if you boiled it down even more, my brain is firing really quickly. And what happens is I utilize my resources really quickly and I burn out fast. And so when you see me in these points of time, I either have expended so much energy doing other things that I need time to reset. And that's what you're perceiving as laziness, but I'm just kind of starting my process up again. And I feel like when you phrase it like that, instead of, why do you always call me lazy? You don't understand what I'm going through. It it moves away from being a confrontation more to a conversation. Mm. Oh, I I think also at some level, and I think this is just like kind of the, the growing up of it all, is like you have to come to peace at some level. I think everyone does about different things, not always necessarily something like a mental health issue. Could also be life choices. It could also be... Um, you know, profession, whatever it might be, like, 
everyone I think at some point has to come to terms with like there's just going to be assholes in your life who <laughs> yeah. say ignorant things and don't believe you and um, ask judgmental questions and insinuate things and you really I think like no one will be free until they release those people and it doesn't mean you have to like go no contact with them like sometimes maybe you do but like you can also just say like this person is going like I have certain life choices that certain people in my life say really not nice, very judgy, very dismissive things about. And now it's like, I mean, truly water off a duck's back. I don't give a shit. I really don't give a shit what they think. And I think if you're in a situation where, like I think it's always really important to ask yourself on a really sort of practical level, does this a person's opinion matter on this subject because like for example if you have an employer who is not respecting a diagnosis and is like not taking you know in this case your ADHD seriously and that's impacting your job like that person's opinion does matter in this context and like you may need to get a different job or to you know radically change that but if it's just like you know your mother or something that you don't live with and haven't lived with for 10 years and she's not paying your bills and she's like does her opinion on this subject matter? It might feel bad, but are there real consequences to just saying, okay, I mean, I disagree, but we just don't have to talk about it, you know? So I'll add one layer of complexity to that. Mm. So with ADHD, there's a concept called rejection-sensitive dysphoria, oh. which is not, I mean, again, this isn't in the um, DSM, but like almost 100% of people with ADHD has, has this specific phenomenon, which is a just an intense emotional, sometimes physical pain or discomfort when it comes to real or perceived rejection or criticism. Mm. So this, so like when you're talking about water off a duck's back, I mean, I think I've worked really hard to get closer to that, but I can't, I give a shit about everything. You do. I give a shit about everything. <laughs> I mean, I care so much about what people are saying, what people are thinking about me. I think about it constantly. And the thought of like being able to roll stuff off my back, I'm like, what's that like? That would be awesome. <laughs> um, so I think that for people experiencing that, where they're like, I, I just, I can't do that. I think exactly what you're saying. I think if you get to a spot where you're able to weigh, how much does this opinion matter? So not necessarily, because I think they're always going to feel like that opinion matters. But like if you can weigh and if you have a scale of things, like is this going to impact my life significantly or not impact my life significantly, you can work on getting past it. But I don't think I've ever gotten to a point where I don't care. I can't. I can't I care about everything. I, I care. About, I am literally distracting myself because I think I, I think I um, offended my Uber driver this morning. Maybe you did. I think I did. <laughs> Maybe you did. I didn't I, hear the question. He asked where I was from and I didn't hear it. And it felt like he, I was ignoring him, but I wasn't. I wasn't. If you're listening, I wasn't. <laughs> hey, she wasn't ignoring you. She, yeah. She's doing her best. Please. No, that's, I mean, that's a good, honestly, this is, I'll leave this in the cut because this is a good thing for me to remember is that there, the, I'm very, my orientation on this channel and in life is trying to be extremely pragmatic about like sort of like weighing down like you do a cost benefit analysis and you draw a line and anything under that line who cares and i don't know why that's always been rally relatively easy for me to do um but i do think it's worth remembering that for a lot of people even if rationally they know that it has absolutely no bearing on their life that it's very very hard for them to let go however i will say and this is something that i didn't used to do and i know many people don't do it i don't think enough people even take that first step of True. trying to and I think you can do it quite literally. I think you can actually write it down. I think not enough people take the step of saying like, what is the actual, and for me, a lot of it comes down to going to the very logical conclusion of what is the worst possible outcome. Um, and really forcing myself to, you visualize it. Sometimes you write even a game plan out for what that worst possible outcome is. Um, because as those of you who have been longtime viewers of the channel, I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder uh, several years ago. And I would not say I feel like I'm cured or, or anything like that, but I do think I managed quite well. And although that particular thing was never like my biggest issue, I do think there were a lot of back to the conversation of easy wins, relatively low hanging fruit that I was not at all doing. And I think that's also part of what makes this topic so complicated because 
the line between what is within your control to improve and the things that you are doing to sabotage yourself in some ways and what is out of your control to to change can feel so blurry and there was a time there was a time when it felt impossible for me to not stay up till four in the morning every night like working on small things that I like did not need to be doing um and for a lot of people I think the first step has to be trying to at minimum do the sort of purely cognitive work of like what are the actual potential consequences here what am I like what is even remotely within my control Mm -hmm. and I think that that eventually boils down to exactly what we were talking about, recognizing your own patterns, right? So being cognizant of your own patterns helps you recognize like, okay, if I'm doing this, this might be something that comes up a lot. So being able to go through and take away the emotional part of it Mm. so you can see it just black and white for what it is, I think there is a huge value in that. It's a huge value, but it's also, a, a, you know, it's a skill set that, has to be practiced and learned and and developed because I think for a lot of people it doesn't come naturally no I don't think it does and I also think again like some of the things that can be like for me for example my use of technology was terrible and that's a question that has come up several times and so I'll just sort of amalgamate them but one thing that I think and it's as we discussed earlier like a lot of this stuff has clearly existed for a long time but one thing that has not existed for a long time is our phones is our Mm -hmm. computers and the ways in which our access to not just technology but you know in the case of social media a million people on the opposite side of our phone that we now have unfettered access to that is new and that is I think for a lot of people really difficult for human brains I know for me um, when it pertained to anxiety like the certain ways that I was using social media that I was using my technology even just the light itself was really really harmful for me but it's not it's also not something a lot of people can totally opt out of mm-hmm. um, so the questions from, you know, the AB, the ADHD perspective are like for people who know that technology plays a role in their symptoms and in their management of those symptoms, um, what are some relatively low hanging ways to improve your relationship with and your use of these things? Okay. So at that point, at this, you know, they've already recognized, yes, social media and my exposure to social media is causing dysfunction, whether it's like increasing distractibility, whether it's increasing FOMO and the, you know, increasing um, just emotional dysregulation that comes with that. Um, they've already recognized that that's a problem. At that point, it it's how big of a problem is it? So is this something that, it, you know, once you dip your toe in, it's, it's just, you know, the floodgates open and then it's impossible to pull yourself away from. If that's the case, then maybe this isn't for you because maybe the the risks of it far outweigh the benefit. Is it something that, you know, I am going to set limited times where I can use it and then I can use it to kind of decompress and then I can pull away from it easily? Okay, well, then maybe it's just taking those steps to set, like for me, I cannot be on social media during the workday. I will not get work done. Mm. Won't happen. And so I, I, I need to set like that aside for me. Like I'm not going to do that. So like when I'm posting on social media or things like that, it's all scheduled and like things like that. So if, if I have a day off, okay, maybe I can do that in between. Um, but if I'm at work, I, I, can't open that and that seems like such a dumb thing (laughs) but and a no-brainer but for me that was especially during covid where everything moved telehealth i was on my phone all the time and so it became like muscle memory i would be like on a screen doing my telehealth appointment and like checking my vpn or whatever and then like my thumb would just take me to instagram or take me to YouTube, or take, you know, um, and so it, it was a, it, a, again, this was another example of not knowing my patterns until later. So recognizing how big of a problem is it, and, and it controlling your consumption. Mm. Yeah. And I'm sure that applies to a lot of things as well. Mm-hmm. Also, another thing that's, can be easier said than done, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, all of these things are. Okay. <clears throat> Is it possible to manage ADHD symptoms without medication or caffeine? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But let me tell you, um, let me tell you 
a little bit about like a personal anecdote and then I'll, I'll go into why that's possible. So when I was in, so growing up, diagnosed in fourth grade was on medication. Do you mind sharing what medication? It was methylphenidate. So the, the generic of Ritalin. Okay. So I took that same dose, fourth grade to 12th grade. Um, and then I entered medical school. Things were really hard. I didn't want to believe I had ADHD. I skipped to, like, when I finally was like, okay, I made my piece. Like, this is way harder than it has to be. Let me try medication again. I tried probably every other medication in the world. Like, I tried Ritalin again. It didn't work. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating. I wasn't, like, it just, it was just a mess. And then I finally found a combination of medication that worked and it got me through the tail end of medical school. And then, um, and then I got into residency and then when I was in residency doing stuff, I liked doing psychiatry, doing stuff I really immersed myself in. And when I was surrounded by people that wanted to help me with my habits and break down things to be accessible, I started to need the medication less. And again, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm not pro or anti medicate Like, if you need it, you need it. If I need it, uh, like, I will take it. Like, if, but I, at that point in my life, it it was getting harder for me to take the medication because I was getting headaches and I wasn't eating again. And I was like, what is happening? And then when I got out of residency, um, I got married and I was um, trying to have my first kid. And so I was like, okay, well, this might be a good time to try not being on medication. And since that time, since that trying period, so that was about seven, six, six-ish, seven years ago, um, I haven't been on medication since then. And it's because I relied so heavily on that time where I was on medication and on and working on those behavioral techniques. So what I tell my patients is that you can address this in whatever way works for you. You can do medication if that's appropriate and working through with your physician and figuring out what works. But also if you get down to the nitty gritty and you work on like behavioral techniques, and I mean, that's part of the reason why I wrote that book. That's part of the reason where I love this app is because that's what it's cultivating. Because I think the behavioral component, even if you're on medication, I don't think you're going to feel like you achieve success or like that you feel on top of it without that part of it. I will also say, um, again, not ADHD, but I, similarly to you, cycled through a lot of medications for anxiety and sleep uh, issues, Um, some of which are, it's shocking to me that they are not more like, I, looking back, I'm like, some of these were prescribed a little lightly for as crazy as they are. Like they, especially sleep aids, like they don't tell you that if you don't fall asleep on those drugs for whatever reason, I'm not exaggerating. Like you're actually hallucinating. Like you I felt like I, balls. Yeah. you are, tr- I, listen, I'm not going to talk about other drugs I might've done, but suffice <laughs> to say there was some overlap, but anyway, uh, and I have not taken any kind of pharmaceutical for I don't know, like, I mean, obviously like over the counter stuff, but nothing for similar to you, like six, seven years. And I would say I feel infinitely better now than I did even when I was on stuff that was working the best, which is, it's hard to even say that without sounding like you're insinuating that everyone should do it, which Uh -uh. is totally not the case. I think there are a lot of people who, you know, every person's situation is different. However, I used to, I genuinely used to live my life thinking that I would never be able to sleep like a remotely normal person unless I was like on some kind of, you know, constant drug cocktail. And that hasn't been the case for years. So it definitely is possible. It's possible. And I think that when, when you focus on that behavioral component and like you actually break it, when you have an understanding of your brain, when you break down those kind of things, I think that's the part of it. Medication can absolutely help, absolutely help. And a lot of people need it and I have definitely needed it. And if I need it in the future, I will absolutely look into it again. But I think it was the behavior, actually nailing down the behavioral part that changed my life, changed my life. Same. Yeah. (laughs) Slay. Okay. (laughs) Uh, All right. We have time for just a couple more quick questions. Um, Oh, interesting. You're very well positioned to answer this. Do you think the children should be prescribed Ritalin? Because I've noticed it heavily disrupting sleep cycles and eating habits for my little one. I know. I mean, so here's the deal. It's hard to answer that question because I think true patient care is personalized, right? I I can't make a blanket statement because it depends on the patient. What is best for the patient? 
So what I tell people is when we're having that initial conversation about medication, right? I tell them that the initial, I would a hundred times out of a hundred times, I would rather underdose the patient and have them not be taking like the full amount that they should be taking because I think you can make up the rest of that with behavioral modification Mm -hmm. rather than give them more medication and have them now have to deal with other things that they have to behaviorally modify. Now I can't sleep. Now I can't eat. Now I can't do all this other stuff. So I think if you're getting into a spot, the right medication should make you feel like you just on a good day. So you're not going to be at 100%. You're not going to be like super laser focused 24 hours a day because I don't think that's part of the human condition. I think you should just feel a little bit more capable and more confident and feel like your skill set is more reliable and and then use that behavioral use the medication if you're on medication to build habits to sustain you i personally feel that i was over prescribed uh, anecdotally and i also think that for a lot of people now chances are if you're who knows everyone's different but like for a lot of these drugs like for example benzodiazepines which are prescribed for people with anxiety frequently like i personally didn't realize for example how easily addictive they are and I feel very lucky that I I just really never liked the feeling that that it gave me whatsoever so I stopped using them almost immediately I never even used my like um, the first prescription I had filled uh, of the two that I was trying but they um so many people get addicted to oh, pharmaceuticals so, so quickly and so it can fast. happen in a matter of weeks I've read um, days. days 10 days 10 days. And uh, I've also read, and this is something you could probably confirm, that you know benzodiazepines are some of the hardest drugs to come off of. Yeah, you'll seize. It's you'll bad. You'll seize. Um, and so I do think, and I mean, it's every doctor is different, but I do think that it is, like you said, from a person, the, from the perspective of the person who is being prescribed, like always worth it to like if you're getting prescribed right away like without much without too many questions without like a ton of experience with that doctor like that maybe should be a bit of a red flag and i also think that your doctor should be talking to you about and you know to be totally totally candid with you adhd is even in psychiatry not talked about a whole lot Mm. like i feel like this wasn't it i i kind of niched down into a clinical specialty because I had that personal interest because I wanted to know what was happening in my own brain. So that's what kind of led me down this pathway of like research and and looking into alternative mechanisms to treat things. And so, but like within medical school and within training, it, it's not, like it's something that kind of comes up peripherally, but there's not a lot of dedicated time to it. So it, it might not be the clinician's fault, but I think that I don't think mental health is is something it, addressing mental health effectively can ever be done with just medication. I think that therapy part of things and that understanding and that even just like personal understanding, it doesn't need to be formally through a therapist, but like behaviorally and understanding from a fundamental level, what am I actually dealing with is so pivotal in that. Agreed. Um, Well, kind of on the opposite side though. So we have a lot of questions along these lines. So what is the difference between ADHD and other executive function disorders? Because I feel like everyone I know has ADHD right now, and I'm wondering if it's being conflated with other disorders that impact executive function. And on that note, do you think that we're over-diagnosing ADHD post-COVID slash work from home slash global TikTok addiction? Um, that's such a good question. Um, I'll start with that. There was a couple of questions in there. So I'm going to start with the last question. Last question is, do I feel like this is over-diagnosed? Yes and no. So so I feel like it's it's a population issue kind of thing. There's some patient groups where I feel like it is not talked about enough. I think it's skipped over. It's not an accessible diagnosis and people don't go to ADHD and they immediately assume it's a behavioral issue and they mm-hmm. think it's something else and it's oppositional defiant and it's and they're they're taken through these completely different wrong pathways. Whereas I think there are other populations where it's like this is not ADHD. This is normal. Like someone can't focus and you're having a little bit of difficulty focusing for an exam, but it's not bleeding over into the rest of your life. This is totally functionally normal, but you're being given ADHD medication for. 
So it's like, and you can break that down by race, socioeconomic status. You get, there's so many different like ledges where you can kind of pinpoint data. Um, so yes, it's overdiagnosed. Sometimes it's underdiagnosed sometimes. Yeah. And I mean, I think not to be a broken record on this channel, but I think we underestimate the role of capitalism in the sense that like, you know, middle, like young to middle aged, young adult to middle aged women are really disproportionately, especially I think white, more affluent, et cetera, are really disproportionately diagnosed with things like anxiety, depression, et cetera. Mm and there's a whole lot to unpack there, but like one of the key things is that like when you look at a lot of those same demographics, these are people who on aggregate like are working full time, also have the responsibility of being the full time um, primary caregiver to children, um, have, you know, are living in conditions which are pretty unprecedented and pretty like it's no surprise that people would feel really unable to cope in a lot of ways and they're, you know, whatever the actual sort of outcome is of that, you know, for example, a lot of people end up Mm -hmm. self-medicating. A lot of people end up, you know, forming really, really bad habits out of this stuff. But to me, there are a lot of, when you look at a lot of the ways that people have to live under our current system, especially compound that with how inaccessible healthcare is, Mm -hmm. it's not shocking at all that tons of people would be breaking down a little bit. Yeah, And, and I think when you, like the first part of the question where it was talking about executive function, right? Executive function is, well, executive dysfunction is a breakdown in those, that skill set in goal-oriented activity, the planning steps that take to get a task started, to complete a task, to do all of those other things wrapped up in that. So included in that is time planning and, you know, budgeting, stuff like that. So, so much is involved in executive function um, breakdown. And you can see that in a lot of things. You can get that in like other medical conditions. Thyroid stuff is notorious for that. Autoimmune stuff, notorious for that. Chronic pain. A lot of different things you can see have that issue. I think what we need to kind of remain in the scope of is that ADHD is not just this, I can't focus sometimes. It is this longitudinal and pervasive pattern of behavior. This isn't, there's not an off switch. It's it's just over the course of your existence, you've had this and it's chronic in nature and it's a disorder. A lot of people shy away from the term. Uh, they don't like the disorder part of it, but I think it's really pivotal in understanding like this is something that impacts your life negatively. And what what I think, you know, this rhetoric of like, and you hear it all the time. I don't know if you hear it. I'm on a very weird part of TikTok. But like you hear ADHD is my superpower like all day long. And it is the most, <laughs> I, mean, I hate it because I feel like it is so, um, like it marginalizes everybody else that's struggling. Mm. Like I a I, hundred times out of a hundred times, I would not, if you gave me the option of, do you want ADHD and you'll have these uh, positives that intermittently come about? Or would you rather not have it? I'd be like, mm, I would rather not have it. <laughs> that is where I would rather be. <laughs> and so I think that learning how to cope and to function, you can get some great positives out of it. But I don't, I, I think that it's important to keep keep that emphasis on the disorder part because it is a, it's not just like I can't focus one time and now I have ADHD. No, this is something that has followed you around and it's impacted your life. Um, man, I guess that's the one upside to anxiety is nobody's out there being like, wow, having anxiety is my superpower. I love this. <laughs> like, I'm so glad that this is uh, the way that my brain works. Um, well, it has been such a pleasure having you here. Yeah. It's so excited that I was able to see you in person. It's very cool. <laughs> um, so please remind everyone where to go, what the book is called. Yeah, so Self-Care for People with ADHD, released by Simon & Schuster in j- this January. Um, and it um, is, you can get it really anywhere. Um, it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, the Simon & Schuster site. I saw it in a Target. It was a big day for me. A Target, <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> And then um, the app Focus Genie will be out um, hopefully in the next month or two. We're doing our last bit of performance testing. And then 
we're good to go. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. Yes. And thank you guys for tuning in. And I will see you next Monday on an all new episode of the Financial Confessions. Goodbye. Yeah.